Does the King James Bible teach racism? Oh boy, another controversial subject. Well, this question has been asked me many times, you know, what does the Bible teach about uh, races and things, and just stick with me here. But uh, what does the Bible teach about these things? And uh, a lot of people are afraid to preach this type of stuff simply because it offends. There's many offensive things in the Bible that our modern politically correct system um, has brainwashed people into not being open to. And um, if you're a Bible believer, uh, you know, you're supposed to preach the whole counsel of God. There are no parts of the Bible that you should be ashamed of. All right, you should be able to tell people, you know, give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. The Bible talks about, I realize that's about salvation, but also, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of the talking about the Bible, what the Bible actually teaches. So let's get into this subject now, okay? And leave your feelings and your emotions right here at the beginning of the sermon, all right? If you are going to get offended, simply if you're already offended and you're already shutting down to the truth up here and you're not open to what the Bible says, well, you know, just shut it off and go watch some other junk on YouTube. There's plenty of junk on YouTube, you know, Lady Gaga or whatever, you know, some of this other satanic filth. You know, there's plenty of stuff that you can waste your time on on YouTube. Okay, you know, I, the, the whole thing is when you learn, you know, and you, and you get into the Bible, you'll realize that you'll offend people no matter what you do. Okay, you can speak the truth in love, and I, I do, I try to. Sometimes I get a little bit irritated with people, but, you know, the fact is you're always going to irritate somebody, you're always going to annoy somebody, you're always going to offend somebody. Truth offends. Okay, but if you're a Bible believer, you'll look at this sermon and you'll compare what I'm saying to what the Bible says. And if I'm wrong, then you'll say, hey, Brother Brian, I appreciate some of what you do, but you're very wrong in this issue because the Bible says. You won't tell me I'm offended by what you said because my feelings. You'll answer me from the Bible. All right. Now, is the word racism in the King James Bible? No. No. How about the word race? Yes, the word race is in the King James Bible. Well, I'm just going to read the, the uh, four references here to the word race. Psalm 19, verse 5 says, Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with, race, with patience the race that is set before us. Those are your four references to the word race in the King James Bible. How many of those had to deal with a person's nationality? Zero. Okay, so I specifically titled this sermon, Does the King James Bible Teach Racism for a Reason? Because racism is the modern politically correct term, or race, or races. And I actually, I used that one of my sermons years ago, and I had a brother, and you're probably watching this right now, you know who you are. I'll, I won't name you, I don't know if you want to be named. But uh, the point is, brother, you corrected me, and you said the Bible does not, the King James Bible does not say race, or races, or racism, you know, in reference to somebody's nationality. And I looked it up, and I was like, Hmm. You see, our speech as Bible-believing Christians should be based upon the King James Bible. All right, The words that you use should line up with this book. And races is a modern politically correct term. So, does the Bible have the word racism in it? No. But does the Bible teach things about the different tongues, kindreds, people's nations, yeah, the Bible does talk about that there are differences there, and we're going to look at those differences today. Now, I know some of you are already probably getting very offended right now, and you're saying, oh no, he's going to teach racist types of things and supreme races and racial supremacy and stuff like this. No, I'm not. 
All right, I'm going to teach you what the Bible says. And you're going to need to look these things up in the Bible to see if these things are so. Be a good Berean, you know. All right, and check into what I'm saying here. Turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Now, when you start talking about kindreds and people and tongues and nations, uh, typically this is where they're going to go. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. It says here, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Okay? Now turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. So you see there, all nations are of one blood. Right? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Okay? Who... Who are, you know, if you go back, uh, your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents, and you keep going back through the generations, what was the original couple there? You know, our great, 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 and on through grandparents. Who were they? You say, uh, two monkeys in a banyan tree or something. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, uh, evolution is stupid. Okay, it's a fairy tale for adults, a opium pipe dream. Evolution is completely without real scientific backing. All right, there's no proof for evolution at all. It's a religion of fools. And you know, I'm I'm not just being, you know, insulting and sarcastic. It is a religion of fools. Atheists, their religion is evolution, because an atheist thinks that we're getting better and better and better. We're evolving. You know, we're going to become gods eventually. Gee, I heard that before somewhere. You know, um, it. And the Bible calls, the Bible says, a fool hath, the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. So an atheist, by biblical definition, is a fool. So evolution, it requires faith because you weren't there to see it evolve, so therefore it's a religion. So atheists believe in evolution, it's their religion, so it is technically, by Bible definition, it is a religion of fools. See, a lot of the stuff that, that comes out of my mouth and things, a lot of things I say that sound very insulting and things, you know, I realize people get insulted by it, but the fact is, it lines up with Scripture. I'm just using Bible terminology. And that, again, goes to this sermon. A lot of people are going to get offended by what I'm going to be saying today, you know, but if it lines up with the Bible, then your problem is really not with me. Your problem is with the book. And... Who wrote the book? God wrote the book. So in actuality, your problem is not with what I'm saying. Your problem is with what God says. You say, well, you shouldn't preach certain parts of the Bible, Brian. You should just cover up things that are unpleasant or uncomfortable. Oh, uh, well, then I'd be like every other hireling out there or every hireling out there, you know. I'm not going to be that. You know, eventually, and I've seen this thing in time and time and time again, eventually I'm going to offend you somewhere. A lot of you, you know, are blessed by the sermons, and I appreciate that. I appreciate all the people saying, hey, brother, you really are blessing. Eventually you're going to get hit. Eventually I get hit. All right? That's just the nature of, of us as sinful people. Eventually the Bible's going to step on your toes. Somewhere, someplace. Now, if I'm not in line with Scripture and I step on your toes, well, then, you know, you can kick me. But if I'm saying what the Bible says and you get offended at it, it's not my problem. It's your problem. All right? And it doesn't mean that I have a bad attitude because of that. I'm not trying to be sarcastic or being smart or, or trying to hurt your feelings. I'm not. I'm just saying, you know, I am not going to be. I personally have gone through years and years and years of being lied to by preachers. And I don't appreciate that. And so when the Lord put me into the ministry, called me into the ministry, I purposed it in my mind. I said, Lord, I'm going to preach the truth to the very best of my ability, the very best that you give me. Show me from the Word of God. I'm going to do my very best. And I realize I'm going to offend a lot of people. But I'd rather offend you with truth than please you with lies. I'm just not going to do that. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So who is your ancestor? Eve. You say, you're a black man. Well, your mother's Eve. You're a white man. Your mother's Eve. You're Oriental. Your mother's Eve. You're Jewish. You're Indian. You're 
you know, Spanish, you're Russian, you're Canadian, you're your Mother's Eve. Isn't that what the Bible says? Yeah. God's made of one blood all nations that dwell upon the earth. And your Mother's Eve. Right? Well, then we're all the same, right? No. All kindreds, peoples, and tongues and nations are the same, right, Brian? No. No. And now we're going to get into that. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 4. So we know that Adam and Eve are the first parents there. And they were created. But look, let's look here and see what happens. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. How many sons did they have? Two. Okay? That's how the thing got started. All right? Now, if you read down through there, we're not going to read all the verses for sake of time, but you can read down through that chapter there, and Cain kills Abel. You know, there's an old joke that goes around, how long did Cain hate his brother as long as he was Abel? You know, ha, ha, ha. But the fact is, he killed his brother Abel. Now, what happens? Genesis chapter 4, verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Uh, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from the, thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Now look at this. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, and lest any finding him should kill him. Okay? Now, there's a teaching that's out there, which is one of the most idiotic I've ever heard of, and that is that this mark that God set upon Cain was that God made him a black man. And this was somehow the start of how the black race came about and they are cursed somehow or something, because you, later you see Canaan, you know. Uh, that teaching is extremely, extremely stupid. Okay, anybody that, that espouses that is totally ignorant of what the Bible teaches. Okay, first of all, Canaan was the son of Ham, not Cain. Okay, secondly, it says a mark. It doesn't say God changed his skin collar. Thirdly, even if that was true, Cain and his descendants would have died out in the flood because the godly line moves from those first two sons, Cain and Abel, it moves from them to the third son, Seth. So the godly line goes to Seth. It doesn't come through Cain. So how could you have him being the father of the black people? It's stupid. See, and there's a lot of people that will try to take the King James Bible and try to use it to teach racial supremacy. And the King James Bible does not teach racial supremacy. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean God does not have a chosen people. God does have a chosen people. We're going to see about that as we continue. But teaching that one race is somehow superior to another and using this to, to try and prove it? No. That doesn't work. So don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that. But what about this thing of God putting a mark upon Cain and, you know, to protect him? Revelation verses 7 and 2 says, I, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So God actually seals and basically puts a mark. And you see that in the Old Testament. There's another reference to they put a mark, you know, on their forehead there. And then, you know, they're not supposed to be killed. So there are many, many times where God actually puts a seal on people to protect them. Kind of interesting because it says there in Ephesians that we are sealed under the day of redemption. Hmm. Very interesting. You see, as a Christian, you're sealed. You have the Holy Spirit's seal of promise. The Holy Spirit there is on you as a Christian. You can't lose your salvation. Which, of course, means that you can't go into the time of Jacob's trouble. See, that's one of the greatest proofs that a Christian cannot go into the time of Jacob's trouble because we're sealed under the day of redemption. But the Bible says in Revelation 14, if any man takes the mark, he goes to hell. 
and burns any man. You know, and the, and the, the thing that they do is they'll say, well, yes, but it, see, a Christian that would take the mark proves that they weren't really a Christian in the first place. <laughs> that is stupid. Okay, there's no nice way for me to put it. It's stupid. All right, I can tell you right now, um, the vast majority of Christians today would take the mark if it came up. Okay, if we were going to go through that time of Jacob's trouble, I'll guarantee you there are a lot of Christians out there that would take that mark. All right, they're so, you know, they don't care about things and government intrusion and stuff and privacy. They're doing things all the time. All right, and if it came to a point of buying or selling, there, I know for a fact that there would be Christians that would justify, well, I got to put food on the table and I got to have my job and I got to have this and I got to have that. You know, I got to have my cell phone and I got to have my Facebook account and my QR codes on the back of, of whatever, my, my iPhone and all this other stuff. You know, there would be Christians that would do that. All right. And that, that, the whole system of the, the control grid, you're being tracked, GPS tracked wherever you go, that stuff's already there through your iPhone, through a lot of the other stuff. You know? You say, well, then you're saying that the iPhone is the mark of the beast. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, that's the technology that's leading to it. So if Christians went into the time of Jacob's trouble, lots and lots and lots of them would be taking that technology that would damn them to hell. See? That's how you know you're not going into it. Because as a Christian, you are sealed. So that sealing there, God seals people down different situations and things. Here's the first time that he does it with Cain. Actually puts a mark upon him and says, anybody that kills you is going to answer to me seven times. You know, it's going to be real bad for them. So, turn next to Genesis chapter 4. Well, we're in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Okay, it says here, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God saith, or said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam, and the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Uh... Male and female created he them, and blessed their name, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And then it goes down through the godly line there. That goes down through Seth. Okay? So, that's important to get. Now what happens after that? We'll go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is what we're going to read down through. So you would have had Cain there and his descendants. You would have had uh, Seth and his descendants and then their relatives and then their relatives and then their relatives and then all these families. Uh, this is a period of time here, um, you know, you know, at least, uh, I, I don't have the exact number with me right now. I didn't write this down for the sermon, but well over a thousand years. You know, this first from the fall there of the Garden of Eden up until the time of the flood. All right. Well, let's continue here. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. We're going to read this quick here. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. If you want to know what those sons of God were, listen to my sermon, Angels, What Are They? Okay? Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, much like today. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now let me just stop there for a minute. These people were going after strange flesh. Noah wasn't. 
So even though this, this godly line of Seth came down through and Noah was one of those descendants, you know, this godly line, a lot of those other people and other families were messing around with strange flesh. And God looked down and said, well, you know, I need to find somebody here that I can continue, you know, this humanity, you know, mankind, excuse me, I, won't, I shouldn't have said humanity, mankind, because humanity is not a Bible word. Um, but God says, I need to preserve mankind. Who am I going to deal with? He looks down and he says, has anybody here not messed around with strange flesh? Oh, there's one, Noah. And he's in this godly line, okay? But uh, look at verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And, Noah said unto, er, and God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Okay, so God says to Noah there to build an ark. Why? Because God's going to destroy the earth with a flood. Now go to Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And I'm skipping a lot of stuff here for sake of time, but you can go back and you can actually, you know, read this in your, in your spare time. Or you can even pause the video here and read it, you know, as we're going through it. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So God decides he's going to spare. I mean, God could have easily wiped out everybody and started over. See? But then that would have caused his word to contradict because it says Eve is the mother of all living, you know, and things. So that would have been a problem. So God looks down and he says, even though everything's wicked and all flesh is corrupt before me, I can still find one righteous man and his three sons one righteous family all right and he brings him into the ark now jump down to verse 7 there in chapter 7 verse 7 and Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood and of course he brings two of every you know beast in there and, and seven of another kind there again I'm not going to get into all that stuff but the whole point here is God brings one family he didn't say, well, these other people, they're, they're good too, and, and I don't, you know, really want to, you know, be prejudiced or something like this. No, God says, that one family, I'm taking them. That'll be important as we continue. Genesis chapter 7, verse 17. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. So it rained 40 days and 40 nights, and the water 40 nights, and the water was upon the earth 150 days before it went down. So did all flesh die at that point? Mm -hmm. So then all of Adam and Eve's descendants lived, and we still are with them today, right? No, just one family and three sons. So you see, yes, Eve is the mother of all living, but something happened between then and now. And it was the flood. And this is the only time in history that, that the whole world was judged. Other times throughout history, you'd see Jerusalem being judged, or this nation or that nation being judged, but never the whole world. Okay, But it will be in the future, by the way, the time of Jacob's trouble. 
That's going to be the second time when God actually judges the whole world. No exceptions. But you see that thing there, only one family survives. And there are three sons. Okay. Now, go to Genesis 9. Genesis 9, verse 18. That's where we're going to go. You say, well, did all of uh, Noah's sons do the same thing after the flood? No. Let's look here. Genesis 9, verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Okay, let me just stop there. Who repopulated the earth? He said, oh, all the people that were there, you know, the descendants of Eve. Well, they were descendants of Eve, Adam and Eve, but it was the three sons of Noah. Plain teaching of Scripture. You say, well, there's no distinction. Well, we'll see about that. Verse 20, uh, down through verse 29 here, we'll read that now. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon uh, both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, that, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Okay? So you had three distinct things that were said there. Canaan, the son of Ham, is a servant of servants to his brethren. Shem, it says there, the Lord God, you know, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. The Lord God would redeem man from his descendants. Okay? And of course you see that later on in the New Testament. Japheth, God shall enlarge Japheth. Okay? I mean, you see that thing there. People say, well, I, I don't really know, you know, I, I kind of reject this. Okay, then you're rejecting the Bible. I mean, you see three distinct things there. All right? And if you think that's just... You know, oh, God just spoke that to those individual sons and then it passed away with them. Uh, you're quite ignorant of, of history. All right. Very ignorant of history, actually. Now, we're going to read Genesis chapter 10 and we're going to see where these descendants disperse to. And you can look at this map here. I'm going to put a map up and see if you can see the names as we're reading. Genesis chapter 10, verse 1 through 5 here says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, you see Gomer there on your map, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, now you aren't going to see the sons there on that map, they don't have that listed, but Ashkenaz, and Rif, Rifeth, and Togar, Togarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Now look at this, verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after the tongue, after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Okay? So who was Japheth the father, the great, 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 great ancestor of? The isles of the Gentiles. What are those islands? You know, those isles. Well, that would be your European nations. That's where those descendants go to. They go up there to the west of where this ark was. And if you study it, the ark basically landed somewhere near the, the, the mountains of Ararat, I think it said, you know, there, the Sinai Peninsula, somewhere in that area, right in that general vicinity there. So the sons of Japheth go west. All right, now let's see about Ham. Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, Mizraim, and Phut and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, 
and Rama and Sabtika, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or some say Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalni in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth, and Kela. And reason between Nineveh and Kela, the same as a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludum, and Ananim, Anamim, and Lehabim, and Naphtuhim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluim, out of whom came Philistim and Kapturim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Geza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Okay, so... There again, you see that the descendants of Ham primarily went down into Africa. Okay, the Sinai Peninsula there somewhat, but mostly over to Africa. So Japheth goes west, Ham goes south. What direction does that leave for Shem? Let's look about that. Verse 21. Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hola, and Gethar, and Mash. And Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almodad, and Sheleph, and Hazar Maveth, and Jira, and Hadurim and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sefer, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, and after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. You say, all the sons of Noah looked the same. Well, they probably did. I don't doubt that. You know, if you went back and you looked at him, I don't think that Ham was, you know, looked like an African, and Japheth was blonde-haired and blue-eyed and fair-skinned, you know, and Shem looked like a, a Jew or something. I, you know, I don't believe that. I believe they looked the same. But the point is, when their families split up and they went down, certain characteristics started to form. I mean, how did this stuff happen? I mean, how is this... A lot of people get offended by this stuff, and I, I really don't understand why people get offended. You know? It just doesn't make much sense to me. Oh, we're all of one blood. We're all of one blood. What are we going to see about that? Let's just... Let's see about that. It is true. We are all of one blood. You can cut anybody open. they got red blood in them. But... Well, then that all means we're the same. No, it doesn't mean that. All right? That's what the Bible teaches. And if you reject this stuff, you're rejecting the book. You're not rejecting me. All right? Let's continue. Look at... Uh, Got to change pages here. But you say, well, you know, why did the sons split up? Well, because they were a family. <laughs> Families split up. You know, how many people can say amen to that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of families split up. But especially when you have Bible believers in the family and people that don't want to accept the truth. But here's why they split up. Genesis chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Okay, all the people were together. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick 
and burned them throughly, and they had brick for stone and slime they ha had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Well, see, isn't that wonderful? They all wanted to come together and, and get rid of differences and all join together and all be part in one big happy family. And that's what God wanted, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they had all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore it is the name of it called Bab Babel, or Babel, however you want to say it, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Of all the earth, excuse me. So you see there, something very instructive. And let me ask you a question. Does God want all people to come together? No. Does He want all people to have one language? And just one, everybody does the same, the same thing, and just all let's just join together in one big city, and let's all come together and put aside our differences? Is that what God wants? No. God wants difference. He wants diversity. Okay? And I don't mean diversity. The modern term for diversity is leave me alone in my sin. Don't tell me I'm doing wrong. You know, you get sodomites saying, you know, diversity, diversity. No, you're just trying to justify your sin. You know, you're in sin. You're not just born different or something. You know, no. God wants natural diversity. He wants natural distinction. Okay, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here as, as we continue, but uh, that's very important to the Lord. And when you get everybody trying to come together, you know, form a new world order, the Lord's not for that. The Lord's not for the United Nations. You better get that thing figured out. Now look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. And of course you have the rest of Genesis 11 explains the descendants of Shem. And interestingly, it says about Shem, not Japheth, not Ham. And you see that theme carried throughout the Bible. That God is only really interested in giving the genealogy of one of those sons, Shem, and his descendants. Hmm, very interesting. But look now at verse uh, 27 there in Genesis chapter 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram. Nahor and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And of course, you have quite a few chapters in Genesis there dedicated to those two men, Abraham and Lot. They become very, Abram later becomes Abraham. Okay, but the, the whole thing is, he starts out as Abram, and you see that there's a very important issue here with this man, Abram. Go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 7, we'll read that. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Interesting there, too. He tells Abram, you know, you go out, I'm going to show you where your descendants are going to, you know, the land they're going to get. Uh, verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance uh, that they had gathered, in the souls, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the uh, plain of Moray, unto the Canaanite, er, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Who is the Canaanite? The descendants of Cain. No, the descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham. Right? Verse 7. 
And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Did the Lord appear to Abram and say, Unto all people, I'm going to give this land. No. He came down and he said, To your seed, to your descendants, I'm going to give this land. Hmm. Let's see about this. Go to Genesis chapter 15. Here you have probably one of the, the most important verses in the entire Bible. This has been around for thousands of years and man has disobeyed this thing over and over and over again. Genesis chapter 15 verse 18 says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed will I, have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now you study the land grant there, the promise that God made to Abram and to his descendants, and you look at what the Jewish people currently control, it's not the land that God promised them. It's only a little tiny little piece right in the center of that thing. Who is inhabiting most of that land? The Arabic people. You know, some of the descendants of Ham, but some of the, you know, technically the Arabs are half Hamite, half Shemite. And, you know, you have uh, Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid of Sarah, Abram's wife, and she uh, gives Hagar over to Abraham, and, you know, they have a son, and that son is Ishmael, and not Isaac. And that son is the, you know, ancestor, the great, 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 great ancestor of the Arabic people. They are the ones that are in the land, most of that land that God has promised. You say, well, they're, they're Abraham's descendants, right? Let's check on that. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Are the descendants of Ishmael, are they technically Abraham's seed? Yeah, they are. Well, then they're heirs according to the promise, right? No. Galatians chapter 4 verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. What was the promise there? The Abrahamic covenant. Unto thy seed will I give this land. Okay? Verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Okay, now in your King James Bible, you have it coming, your New Testament, it's coming from Greek to English, Old Testament from Hebrew to English. So when it says agar, that's your Greek word coming to English for the Hebrew word being hagar in the Old Testament. It's not two different names, it's not a contradiction, it's just a different spelling of the same name. Verse 25, for this agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Is Jerusalem, modern day Jerusalem, are they in bondage with the Arabic people? Mm -hmm. They fight all the time over there. <laughs> Been fighting for thousands of years. Verse 26, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But he then... Or, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're going to see this as we continue here, but it's very important to note that although these Arabic people in Saudi Arabia and, and you know Egypt and some of those other places, although they are technically descendants of Abraham, technically the seed, physical seed of Abraham, they are not heirs to that. Unless, of course, they get saved. If they're Christian, if they're born again, then they're born into that. Then they're heirs according to the promise. We'll see about that as we continue here. But if they're lost, they are not heirs with that. 
you say, well, then the Jews in Jerusalem aren't heirs either. You know, God wouldn't deal with just one kindred like that, right? Yes, he would. You see, God made a promise to Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham that his descendants that are born after the free woman, Isaac, and what was Isaac's son? Jacob. What's another name for Jacob? Israel. So the descendants of Jacob are going to get that land. That land is promised to them. And you say, well, says who? Says God. That land is the Jewish the Jewish people, that's their land over there. Then you say, well, then why aren't they getting it? Because man is standing in the way, and God's going to fix that up real soon. God is going to come in that time of Jacob's trouble, and he's going to fix it up that those Jews get that land. And those, that seed of Abraham is going to finally get what is rightfully theirs. You say, well, then you're saying to me that God is dealing with one kindred of people? Mm-hmm. I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit here, but I just want to make a statement. So, you know, if you're getting sick of this, you can shut it off. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, this book is a Jewish book. The Christians are just a little tiny, little tiny part of this book. You know, I heard, uh, I think it was Sam Gipp the one time said that we are God's plan B. You know, we were not his original plan. We're going to see about that as we continue. But the fact of the matter is, for most of our history, if you're a descendant of Japheth or a descendant of Ham, or even a lot of the descendants of Shem, God wasn't dealing with you. See, that's something that you have to deal with as a Christian. That's what the Bible teaches. That's not my doctrine. That's not my thoughts. That's what the Bible teaches. But continuing here, turn next to Acts chapter 17. Does God make a big deal about land? I mean, do you think God in heaven really cares about what people do with this little puny land down here? Yeah, he actually does. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. You say, well, we already read it. Now, actually, I play a little trick on you. I only read part of the verse. Because, you see, that's what the majority of people do. These people, these one-worlders, these people that want to say, everybody's the same, let's bring all races together, you know, and they'll use the word race, okay, because they're politically correct. They'll say, you know, let's bring everybody together, we're all the same, we're all friends, we're all brethren, and we're blah, 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 blah. They only read, they only read the first part of the verse. I'm going to show you proof of that in just a minute. Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27 says, And hath made of one blood, one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. Why? Verse 27, That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Were the people back there in Babel, were they looking for God? No. They were coming together and counting on each other and saying, let's build a city so that we aren't scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. They all were all one people, one language. Let's eliminate distinctions. Let's, let's get rid of differences. Let's all come together. And God looked down and said, no, split up. And right there, verse 26, I've seen this thing time and time and time again where these people will say, you know, you say, well, the Jews, you know, are God's chosen people. But the Bible says that all nations are of one blood. You know, we'll finish the verse. You say, we'll prove that, Brian. Okay, here's another picture. Babel explains our differences. You know, and what do you have there? Of the three sons of Noah, the whole earth was overspread. I don't even think that's King James, but it shows pretty accurate there. It shows that Japheth, descendants of Japheth go kind of up to the west there. Descendants of Ham kind of go down into Africa. The uh, descendants of Shem, they go east. And then it shows that they go down in, into the Arabian desert there, which, of course, is partly true because you have the Arabs, you know, Hagar, the descendants of her, you know, Ishmael, they go down. But you see there, look underneath the picture of the people in that bottom right corner. God has made of one blood all nations. You mean to tell me that professing Christians would only quote the first half of the verse? Mm -hmm. They do it all the time. All the time. 
You see, what they're trying to prove is that all people have the same blood. Now, is that true? Yes. Well, then we all are the same thing. God has the same promise for all the different kindreds of people, all the different nations, the people, the tongues, races, if you want to use the modern day PC term. We're all the same. No, we're not. No, we're not. You see, they want to eliminate the distinction that God has an Abrahamic covenant and that he is giving a certain piece of real estate on this earth, this planet, you know, not up there in heaven. Okay, it's not the Jews get some piece of land up there in heaven in eternity. They got it here on the earth. And you see, there's all this fighting right now about who controls what and, and you know, what are the true Jews and, and you know, New Jerusalem or, or, you know, the city of the great king is going to be down in Arizona or over in Texas or up Harlem, uh, you know, Harlem in New York or some kind of thing. All these people are trying to get away from what land God has promised to the nation of Israel. They don't want to, they don't want to look at that thing. You know, they don't want to deal with it. But God has promised this land to the Jewish people and they're going to get it. It's just incredible. But you will see that thing over and over and over again. People cover up that verse. They cover up the fact that there are boundaries that God has set. Okay? And he says, you stay in that boundary. You get out of bounds, well, it's really not right. God has set natural boundaries. But you say, well, then just for the Jews, right, Brian? Let's look about that. Genesis chapter 32. Did God just, you know, pick on the, the Jewish people and say, you guys are supposed to go here and everybody else, you just do what you feel like doing? Well, this is a very interesting thing here. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. 